Hello, my name's Jackie, welcome back to my channel, and I'm an aspiring fiction author who is currently attempting to plot out three different book ideas using three different plotting methods to see which ones work, which ones don't, and how I can hopefully combine them into a master plan for when I start writing my next fiction project. And in today's video, I'm using The Story Grid by Sean Coyne. Now, if you are not familiar with this method, Sean is an experienced fiction editor. I don't actually remember how many years of editing experience he has. I believe it's either 25 or 40, so it's a lot in either case. And Story Grid is what he has learnt from reading and editing so many fiction books. It is both a plotting tool, it's also a good diagnosis tool if you already have a draft and you're not sure where it went wrong. Now, at the time of recording the introduction to this video, I am about halfway through the book, so I'm around page 170, I think, and the book is 330 pages long. So I can't actually make a good summary of how valuable it is at this stage, but I do have some qualms already. One of them was that it is an expensive book. This is a paperback, and even though it's a fairly large format, like it looks almost like a textbook, I mean, the font is very large, there's a lot of space that isn't used on a lot of pages, so this could actually have been just a normal 250 page paperback. Um, given that, the fact that it retails at 33 euros, and even I got it for 27 because Book Depository always has sales, but recommended retail price of 33 euros for a paperback seems like a lot, so when I got this my expectations were already pretty high, you know, it'd, ha it'd better be worth it. The truth is, even though I grumble, I was willing to pay that because I had some exposure to the story grid through Sean's podcast, which I mentioned in my video on top podcasts for writers. Now, the story grid is a weekly writing podcast, it covers both fiction and non-fiction, and they did a series like within the podcast that I really liked called The Masterwork Experiment. And this is where Sean partnered up with an experienced writer and they pulled apart a piece of fiction that they considered to be a masterwork, in this case it was Brokeback Mountain, and they put it through the story grid process to figure out how it was built and then use that framework to create a template for another piece of fiction. So when I heard that I was like, yes please, I really want a foolproof framework that I can use to pick apart any great work of fiction and that I can use to create my own great works of fiction, hopefully. So I was already committed to trying this out. Having said that, I am already not sure how useful this book is going to be as an outlining tool, just because I am halfway through the book and I'm still not 100% sure what the process is. There is a lot of philosophizing and not even a lot because it moves fairly quickly but the bulk of the content so far has been quite abstract talking about you know the theory of story in general sometimes giving examples of works that do that follow Sean's recommendations really well but the practical tools in here have been quite few and far between and I am hoping that's just because they're all going to come up at the end of the book now, as someone who has worked on a lot of nonfiction myself, in my former life I was a nonfiction editor and ghostwriter, I like to take the approach of teaching things in these nice contained units. So you introduce something, you explain why it's important, you give examples of how it's been done in the wild, then you tell the reader how they can do it. And then great, they've learnt that thing, they have the knowledge they need to move on to the next step. This book does not do that. This book introduces a whole lot of concepts and then doesn't have the how-to before moving on to the next thing. And that, um, that makes me a little worried because I don't know if it's coming or not or if I need to pull my own how-to out of this book. The other thing that's a little bit frustrating is that a lot of how-to books will give you an overview of the process before you get started. So if it's seven steps, for example, they'll give you a list of what the seven steps are. And that means as a reader, you know where you are in the process as you progress through the book. This hasn't given me that overview. I mean, the book is called Story Grid, so I assume there is going to be a grid at some point, but that has not been introduced. At this stage, we have a list of six questions and we have the false cap method, or loose leaf if you're like me and that's what you call paper. One of the challenges I've had though is that 
these things get introduced and it doesn't introduce them, tell you what they are, then tell you how to do them. It sort of introduces them and then covers everything under the sun related to them. And then hopefully I think we'll get to how to do it. So it's just, I know as someone who's maybe because I'm an impatient millennial, but it has been a little bit challenging to put anything into practice yet because there hasn't been a lot of stuff for me to do. I've just been absorbing everything so far. So for instance, if I go to page 38, and this is actually, so if you're like me and you buy this book and you just want the method, um, you can start reading at page 38. Everything before that is just Sean talking about his experience and what works and what doesn't. I already knew he was experienced. I was already determined to try this, so I didn't need the sales pitch. Now on page 38 is the first practical thing that gets introduced which is, he says, the full scat method is the story grid in miniature. It's a one page version of the story grid and it's the first stop on the way to creating the big matrix that tracks all of the pieces of a story. In this method, we ask ourselves just a half dozen questions of the story we're about to write or have already written. So these six questions are the first practical thing we get and they are, what's the genre? What are the conventions and obligatory scenes for that genre? What's the point of view? What are the protagonist's objects of desire? What's the controlling idea or theme? And what is the beginning hook, the middle build, and the ending payoff? So as someone who thinks and processes things in quite a structured way, I'd go, okay, great, we've got these six questions, and I assume this part of the book is going to explore each of these in depth. But it doesn't really. Like, the next section has, there's probably a good 20 or 30 pages just on genre, and then the other questions, you know, they sort of get address but not completely. So one of my pet peeves with this book at the moment actually is that we have a great discussion on genre. He basically introduces a whole lot of genres and he says that every genre has its obligatory scenes that you need to cover in order for the book to feel satisfying and for it to do its job. Great. I'm like, yes, please give me these obligatory scenes. Then there's a chapter where he talks about the obligatory scenes of a thriller because he's using Silence of the Lambs as a case study throughout this book. And at this stage, I'm thinking that might be the only genre he actually lists the scenes for. But if I'm not writing a thriller, that doesn't help me. Like if I'm writing an action or a horror or a romance or a fantasy or whatever, you know, I want to know what the obligatory scenes are in those books as well. So I'm hoping they still get delivered at some point, but if they don't, then it's a little bit frustrating because this isn't sold as a book that's supposed to teach you how to write a thriller. It's supposed to be an all-encompassing, this is how you write fiction type of book. So there are a couple of cases like that I've found throughout this book where a question was raised or a promise was made and it wasn't delivered, or at least it hasn't been delivered where I am now at the 50% part of the book. When it comes to the method in general, as I mentioned earlier, there was no summary at the beginning but what I can gather from where I am now is that there are maybe three parts. One is the six questions. The second is the full scout method, which is like a one page summary of all of that. It's like a one page outline of your book. I am not sure if you do the six questions separately or if you just answer them as part of doing the full scout, but We'll see. Then I'm guessing that step three is the story grid spreadsheet, which is something he's mentioned a couple of times in passing, but I'm, yeah, I'm not really sure what that includes or if there's anything between having your one page summary and getting that spreadsheet together. So we'll see. For now though, I'm gonna start with the first couple of exercises, hopefully finish reading this over the next couple of days, and then I will know how it all works and I can take you through the process and let you know if the method works and if it makes more sense once you have gotten to the end of the book. So after my introductory ramble, where does one get started with the story grid? And I think I'm not sure <laughs> is the short answer, but there are these six questions. There's also the full scat method. There is a dog coming up the stairs outside my apartment. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, anyway, there are six questions and then there's also the full scat method which addresses these six questions. So I'm not sure if you just do the full scat method and that then addresses said questions or if I should do the questions separately. 
Having said that, the first question is what's the genre? And Sean does have a very in-depth take on how genre should be defined. So I'm going to, I might create an image of this, but this is a two page spread of the book. And basically all of these things are things that should be considered in order to define the genre of the book. There's a five petal flower here. One petal is content, one petal is time, one petal is structure, one petal is reality, and one petal is style. So I'll quickly go through all of this because it doesn't really make any sense until you've been taken through all of it. So what he says is a genre is a label that will tell the audience what to expect. And those expectations fit into a number of areas, which he breaks down into five questions. And these five questions correspond with the five petals of that flower diagram. So question one is how long the story will last. Question two is how far will we need to suspend our disbelief. Question three is the style or the particular experience of the story. Four is how the story will be structured. And five is what will the general content of the story be. So all of these categories then have genres. So for time, there is short form, which might be short films, short stories, or individual scenes. Medium form, like episodic television shows or documentaries, novellas, multi-thousand word journalism, and one act plays. Or long form, so feature length films, documentaries, novels, or three acts or more plays. The next pedal is reality, which is about suspending disbelief. So here the genres are factualism, which is stories that refer to facts of history or biography. Realism, so stories that could happen in real life but are imagined. So something like this is law and order. All of these, there's nothing fantastical in law and order. It's all stuff that could happen, IRL, but it is fiction. Absurdism, so these are stories that are not remotely real like um, Looney Tunes is the example he gives. Fantasy, so these are stories of wonder and imagination that require a comprehensive suspension of disbelief. Category three is style genres. And this is described as the various ways in which we experience a story. So drama, comedy, documentary, musical, dance, literary. Literary has the subgenres of poetry, minimalism, meta, and postmodern. Theatrical, cinematic, epistolary, and cartoons. Then structure genres. So first there's arch plot, which is consistent and has a cause and effect reality like what we experience in our everyday lives. They usually feature a single active protagonist who pursues an object of desire. So a new job, love life, an education, the golden fleece, while confronting primarily external forces of antagonism. So more qualified candidates, a better looking suitor, a high school teacher out to get him, etc. The story ends closed with absolute and irreversible change in the life of the protagonist. There is no going back to the way things were at the beginning of the story. This type of plot encompasses the majority of commercial fiction out there and the majority of films out there. So if you're not sure what yours is, probably arch plot. The other structure genres are mini plot. So if arch plot is all about active single protagonists facing down external antagonism and is the domain of commercial book culture, the studio system in Hollywood, narrative nonfiction in journalism, and the plot driven play, then mini plot is about passive single or multiple protagonists contending with internal strife and is the domain of the literary book culture, the independent film world, long form journalism in nonfiction, and the character driven play. And then the final structural choice is anti-plot, which is difficult to define because it breaks all the rules. So here it says there's no requirement for there to be consistent reality. There's no requirement of causality. There's no requirement to adhere to any time constraints. The protagonist at the end of the story is the same as they were at the beginning. And the characters neither defeat nor surrender to external or internal antagonistic forces. They remain just as they ever were. And then the final pedal in the genre diagram is content genres. And these are divided into external content genres and internal content genres. The external content genres are what most of us think of when we use the word genre. So these are action, horror, crime, Western war, thriller, society, love, and performance. And then internal content genres are about stories driven by the nature of the protagonist in a conflict. So this might be status. So successful failure moving from one ladder of society to another, worldview, a change in life experience from one value change to its opposite, or morality, a change slash revolution of the protagonist's inner moral compass. So question one in these six questions that editors and authors need to answer is what genre is your book? 
and the genre of your book needs to include these five things. So I'm going to quickly attempt to do this for my three ideas. Five minutes later. Yeah. I have done the genres for each of my books and the good news is that it was much quicker to do the exercise than it was to explain the exercise. So the three ideas I'm working on are one is a story about a girl who's a regular girl in her real life but in her dreams she is a courier for a secret organization and she accidentally brings something back with her one night when she wakes up. Story two is about a superhuman who was built in a lab and the government cuts their funding and she escapes but she wants to eat humans. <laughs> Basically she is on like a protein only or meat only diet and when she's out in the real world she wants to eat humans. Uh, the third one is like a stalker type of book. I'm not sure if it's going to be romantic or if it's going to be creepy, but think of You by Carolyn Kepnes, but once the stalker seduces the stalkey, the stalkey turns out to be just as controlling and manipulative. So it's like reciprocal stalking, I'm calling it. So now that you have an overview of what each of the ideas are, what are their genres? Well, the dream spy one, the time genre is long form, the reality is fantasy with the subgenre of human contemporary. The style is drama, the structure is arch plot, and the content genre I think is action. But yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> like I actually got a little bit stuck on both the style genre and the content genre. And the reason I chose drama for the style genre is because I didn't think anything else would fit. It's definitely not a comedy. What were my other options? Uh, not a comedy, not a documentary, not a musical, not a dance, and not literary. So drama is sort of the only thing left. And for content, again, it wasn't horror or crime or western or war or thriller or society or love or performance. So action was the best fit. For my cannibal superhuman one, again, time is long form reality. So how far do we need to suspend our disbelief? It's fantasy sci-fi. Style, again, is drama. Structure, again, is arch plot. And content is either action or thriller. I think I need to develop it a bit further and see which one's the best fit. I'm also tempted to make it a thriller because then I can use the obligatory scenes he's already outlined for thrillers and see how that helps with the outlining, whereas he hasn't done that for action yet. So sort of a little way of cheating my way around this plotting method. Then my reciprocal stalking book. Again, the time is long form, the reality is realism, the style is drama, the structure is arch plot, and the content genre is love. So that is my answer to the first of the six questions that he asks, which is what is the book's genre? If I was to put that in a sentence uh, for reciprocal stalking, it would be, it's a long form, realistic drama, arch plot in the content genre of love. So the next question is then, what are the conventions and obligatory scenes of that genre? And one of the struggles I've had so far, which I mentioned earlier, is that I don't think he actually discusses this beyond giving the example of thriller. So I'm just flipping through the book now. Yeah, so all of part two is about genre. So it's all information that helps you answer that one question. He does have a chapter saying that genres have obligatory scenes, but he doesn't list what they are for different genres. And this is one of the things I was talking about earlier, how like he promises but doesn't deliver sometimes. This is something where I definitely feel he hasn't delivered. So basically he has a short chapter. I think it's two, like, yeah, two and a half pages explaining that there are obligatory scenes. And he goes into another chapter which is talking about innovating on those scenes. But if you don't know what the scenes are, how can you innovate? So what does that mean for these six questions? I think it actually means you can't answer them because part two is all about genre and then when you get to part three of the book that's when it's titled the full scap global story grid so I think this is when you start doing the one page outline so rather than trying to answer the remaining five questions now I'm going to attempt to do the one page outline and then I'll go back and see if I can answer those questions in retrospect. So what is the Fool's Cap one page outline? Well, this is a picture of it in the book. So he has done one page, which is divided into four sections. The first section is 
the global story. So it's where you list the external genre, the external value that's at stake, the internal genre, the internal value that's at stake, the obligatory scenes and conventions, which he has not covered, uh, point of view, objects of desire, and controlling idea or theme. So this is all of the overarching stuff for your story. The last three quarters are each of the parts of the book. So there's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And for each of those, he's actually listed five points that you need to cover in each of them, which I think is quite good. So you have your inciting incident, your complication, your crisis, your climax, and your resolution. And each of the three parts of your book should have that. Now, if you are looking at this book and you have gotten to, what, page 113 and you're confused because you see this list but you're not sure what all of the stuff on here means, don't worry, he hasn't covered it yet. He um, introduces this template and then this part of the book goes on to cover everything that's included in the template. So you really shouldn't need to worry about filling out the template until you get to the end of that part of the book. I actually have gotten to the end of this part of the book. So I am going to attempt to fill this out now for one of my stories. Probably Dream Spy, because I think I have the most on that. And I'll let you know how I go. Also, this just in, the template in the book is not an accurate representation of a loose leaf page. So if I look at the pages in my notebook, which are the exact same layout of the loose sheets of paper you get, I have, I have 33 lines, and that includes the wide line at the top and the bottom of the page. So if I choose to write on both of those, I have 33 lines. In the book, the template he gives has one, two, three, four. <laughs> has 41 pages, so it's almost like a third longer than my page. So I'm going to attempt to fit everything onto a single page, but it realistically might not fit. Just something to keep in mind. So I'm struggling with this a little bit, and I think um, I think part of it is that I'm filming and I'm aware the clock's ticking and that I should get it done. So I am going to turn off the camera for the rest of the day and just take some time to think about um, everything, but part of it is also that this book doesn't explain everything that you need to do when it's frustrating me. So there's, so Sean gives you the template for this fool's cap you need to complete. He shows you a completed one for Silence of the Lambs and then you should be able to complete it yourself. So. I've written out all of the different things I need to address on my paper and there are a couple of things that just aren't discussed in the book or they're discussed but in the context of one example. So for instance you have your external genre which is what we covered earlier so we're looking at action, maybe psychological thriller as I think about it, I'm not sure. Um, then there's an external value at stake and he gives an example of the external value at stake in a thriller, but he doesn't... One, there's only one example, so it makes it really hard to figure out how this is tackled in general. And he also doesn't say whether like, there are conventions for different genres that should be addressed or whether this is unique to each story. Then the same thing happens internally. So there's the internal genre, which is like how someone's word worldview changes or how their status changes. And then there's the internal value at stake. Same thing, there's no chapter on internal and external values in general. There's only a chapter with an example. In fact, if I go back to said chapter, so the points he makes are one, stories have values, then he gives the example of crime fiction. So he says the story value at stake for crime fiction is justice. And he gives like a continuum of what can happen with this value. So it ranges from, ah, oh, I can't get the page. So it ranges from justice to unfairness to injustice to tyranny. Now, this is all good. This scale is interesting, but he only covers it as an example for this one genre. So. That leaves me, as someone who's not writing a crime book, wondering, well, is crime just an easy example to give because that's one genre that does happen to have this central value regardless of the story you're telling? Or do all of the other genres he discussed as well have a particular value they're exploring? And if they do, it would be really helpful to know that. If they don't, it would be really helpful if he said that you can just pull these out of your ass. So. I'm stuck on that because there's no guidance on how to find 
your own external or internal values and I haven't spent any time thinking about them until now so I do need to think a little bit more about that. Um, the other thing is that this does have the obligatory scenes and conventions as one of the items which I've already discussed. That's something where he covers it in relation to thrillers but hasn't covered it for any other genres and I've looked at the table of contents and tried to see whether it comes up later in the book. If it does, it hasn't been indicated very clearly with the chapter titles. So I can't write it off yet because it might be covered later, but it hasn't been covered at this stage when I'm trying to do this exercise, which is really frustrating. All in all, I'm a little bit frustrated and a little bit stuck, but I'm going to turn off the camera and take some time thinking about this and probably check back in tomorrow with how I'm doing. Seven days later. Yeah. It is now the 29th of January, which means it is 10 days since I filmed anything. I have been trying to do some work in that time. One of the things I have done is I finally finished Story Grid. So when I started this video, I was only about halfway through. I <laughs> haven't checked the footage yet, but I believe I was not quite sure if I thought this method would work for me. But I was also hopeful that by the time I got to the end of the book, everything would make sense. The peak of my experience of this book was around page 260, which is when after introducing the one page outline and then going into all of the fundamental things a story needs to cover, Sean came back to the one page outline, then introduced the story grid, then started breaking down Silence of the Lambs using the one page outline. And I thought, oh my god, great, it all comes together, it's starting to make sense now. At that stage my verdict was that the method had promise. It might be more useful as an editing method than as a brainstorming outlining method, but it had promise, it was all coming together, I had hope. Then I kept reading and what happened? So let's take a step back. When it comes to the practical things in this book, there are the six questions that I mentioned last time. There is the one page outline, so the story grid fools cap. There is the story grid, which is a spreadsheet, and that's all I thought there was going to be. So he breaks down Silence of the Lambs, he gives an example of the Silence of the Lambs story grid, then he creates like another story grid, which is a list of the scenes in Silence of the Lambs, and then there are zigzagging lines going across it. So one of the things Sean discusses is internal and external values in a story, and different genres have different values. So the value in a thriller, which I'm going to use because it's the example he uses, is life and death. And these values exist on a continuum, so the value of life and death, the most positive value is life, then the next stage down on the way to death is unconsciousness, then there's death, then there's damnations, so a fate worse than death. And the idea is that your story should be moving between these two points. I'm not quite clear whether it's supposed to be a linear journey from one end to the other, which goes to show that this book is flawed if I still am not sure how it works after getting to the end of this book. There is also the internal journey, so these he also calls internal genres, and in The Silence of the Lambs the genre was disillusionment. So it's the journey from false belief to being completely disillusioned. Now, in his second story grid, I'm not entirely sure what this last framework was, he had a list of scenes and then on one side he like was doing zigzags to illustrate where we were in the journey from life to damnation, and then on the other side he had another zigzagging line to illustrate where we were on the journey from false belief to disillusionment. Honestly, I found that approach really confusing, so I'm not even going to attempt it. What I am going to attempt is doing the one page full scap method and doing the story grid spreadsheet. However, before I do that, one of the things I complained about before was how Sean says there are certain things that are important but doesn't actually cover them in the book, which is incredibly frustrating. So the example I keep giving is that he says every genre has obligatory scenes you need to cover, and with the exception of a thriller, which he covers in detail because Silence of the Lambs is the case study he's using, he doesn't actually share the obligatory scenes for any other genres. 
However, he does have a blog, so I went to the blog to see if I could find these for any other genres, and what I found was that there are a number of articles which are secrets of the X genre. So there's secrets of the romance genre, secrets of the action genre, secrets of the thriller genre, which are the three ideas I'm trying to map out at the moment. If you are considering using this method, I would just go straight to the blog posts. They are written by, if I just scroll down to the bottom, Rochelle Ramirez. So I believe she did all three of these and they are much, much easier to follow than the book. So in these posts, she covers what exactly is the genre, what's the global value at stake. So when I was talking about a thriller, which is from life to damnation, uh, if we're looking at a love story, the value is love and the continuum that exists on is from hate masquerading as love all the through to desire, commitment and intimacy. She has what's the controlling idea, what are the obligatory scenes, which is what I was looking for, what are the conventions of this genre, and what are, what are the subgenres, and how do you structure a love story. So she has what are the key events that need to happen in the beginning, in the middle and in the end. So basically, I think these blog posts achieve what this book was supposed to achieve far more successfully than the book did. So I would start with the blog posts. So I found these blog posts helpful for answering questions I had about the genres I wanted to write in that weren't answered by the book. However, they have raised some extra questions. The main one being that books have been outlined in a number of different ways. So there's the full scap, which has your beginning, middle and end, and in your beginning you need an inciting incident, complication, crisis, climax and resolution. In your middle you need an inciting incident, complication, crisis, climax and resolution, and in the end you need the same five milestones. So that's one outline. Then you have the three-act structure that is outlined partially in the book, partially in the blog post, which says the key things that need to happen in each of those three parts. So. In the beginning, you need to introduce the characters in the world, demonstrate the characters' fears or flaws, demonstrate their want, have an inciting incident, and establish stakes. So in the middle, the antagonist is continually putting obstacles in the protagonist's way. At the midpoint, the protagonist should shift from avoidance to attacking. There are progressive complications, there's a turning point complication, there's a crisis, and in the end, there's the climax and you need to resolve things. So how has the character changed or failed to do so? And how will this affect their life going forward? Then we have the list of obligatory scenes. So if I look at the list of scenes in a romance, we have lovers meeting, one or more of them deny their response to the love they feel. There's a failure to overcome the antagonist. There's a confession of love. There's a first kiss or intimate moment. There's a moment when the lovers separate. There's an all is lost moment. There's a proof of love moment and there's a moment when the lovers reunite, assuming you have a happy ending and a moment when the protagonist is rewarded. And then we've also got the emotional journey. So something that is referred to in both the book and the blog posts is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I believe that's how you say it. I'm sorry if I've got the pronunciation wrong, but this is the woman who came up with the five stages of grief. And what Sean and his editors have done is align those with the plot of a story. So at the beginning hook, you should be feeling shock and denial. In the middle build, anger, bargaining, depression and deliberation. And at the end, choice and integration. So what we have here is four different lists of things that need to happen throughout a book, which is I'm not going to say more complicated, it's just more disorganized than other methods I've looked at in the past. So if I compare this to Save the Cat or Story Engineering, both of those had one linear list of things you needed to address. This is just a bit messier. So what I'm going to do is rather than first attempting to do this one page outline, I'm going to think about each of these separate things. <laughs> so each of the separate points on these four lists and then try to organize them into some sort of plot. And then once I've organized them, I'm going to try and put that into the one page outline. <sighs> Wish me luck. Hello, this is editing Jackie. So I uploaded all of the story grid footage to my computer and there is an hour and 47 minutes. 
which is a little bit much for one video, even after editing. So I am going to split it into two parts. So this is the end of part one. Thank you for watching. I will have part two up in the next few days. And if you are watching this at some point in the future, please look in the description or check the cards for a link to part two. Bye for now.